Welcome back to Dr. Finance. This is a paper written by Theodor Schulz, who won Nobel Prize in Economics in 1979. His paper published in Journal of Pol or Political Economics titled Capital Formation by Education in 1960. Introduction. I propose to treat education as an investment in man and to treat its consequences as a form of capital. Since education becomes a part of the person receiving it, I shall refer to it as human capital. Since it becomes an integral part of a person, it cannot be bought or sold or treated as property under our institutions. Nevertheless, it is a form of capital if it renders a productive service of value to the economy. The principal hypothesis underlying this treatment of education is that some important increases in national income are a consequence of additions to the stack of this form of capital. Although it will be far from easy to put this hypothesis to the test, there are many indications that some, and perhaps a substantial part of, the unexplained increases in national income in the United States are attributable to the formation of this kind of capital. Education can be pure consumption or pure investment, or it can serve both these purposes. But whatever it is in these respects, Education in the United States requires a large stream of resources. The principal task of this paper is to present a set of estimates of the value of the resources that have been entering into education. These resources consist chiefly of two components, the earnings that students forego while attending school and the resources to provide schools. Our estimates begin with 1900, covers the next five decennial years, and close with 1956. The annual factor costs are given in current prices. A major section is devoted to the earnings that students forego while they attend school, both because of their importance and because these foregone earnings have heretofore been neglected. More than half the total resources that enter into high school, college, and university education consists of the time and effort of students. The section on cost of the education services that the schools provide introduces estimates of the value of school property used for education, along with current expenditures for salaries, wages, and materials. Capital formation by means of education is neither small nor a neat constant in relation to the formation of non-human capital. It is not small even if a substantial part of the total cost of education were strictly for consumption. What our estimates will show is that the stream of resources entering into elementary education has increased less than the, that entering into either high school or higher education. But even so, it has been increasing at a larger rate than has the gross information or a gross formation of physical capital. In 1900, the total cost of elementary education was equal to about 5% of gross capital formation compared to 9% in 1956. 
Comparable figures for high school and higher education combined are 4% in 1900 and almost 25% in 1956. Two more introductory comments seem necessary. One on the neglect of the study of human capital and the other on the moral issue of treating education as an investment in men. A serious fault in the way capital is treated in economic analysis has been the omission of human capital. This was a major part of the burden of my Teller lecture. Had economists followed the conception of capital laid down by Fisher, instead of that by Marshall, this omission, so it seems to me, would not have occurred. It is held by many to be degrading to men and morally wrong to look upon his education as a way of creating capital. To those who hold this view, the very idea of human capital is repugnant because of, for them education is basically cultural and not economic in its purpose because education serves to develop individuals to become competent and responsible citizens by giving men and women an opportunity to acquire an understanding of the values they hold and an ap uh, appreciation of what they mean to life. My reply to those who believe thus is that an analysis that treats education as one of the activities that may add to the stock of human capital in no way denies the validity of their position. My approach is not designed to show that these cultural purposes should not be or are not being served by education. What is implied is that in addition to achieving these cultural goals, some kinds of education may improve the capabilities of Asian people as they work and manage their affairs, and that these improvements may increase the national income. These cultural ed economic effects may thus be jointly, uh, joint consequences, may thus be joint consequences of education. My treatment of education will in no way detract from or disparage the cultural contributions of education. It takes these contributions for granted and proceeds to the task of determining whether there are also some economic benefits from education that may appropriately be treated as capital that can be identified and estimated. Ideally, we should look like uh, to, uh, we should like to have estimates of the formation of cap human capital both gross and net, and of the size of the stock, we should also like to know how much, if any, of the increase in national income is attributable to increases in the stock of human capital and to what the rate of return on investment in education has been. There will then be the question, how do parents and students and public authorities respond to these investment opportunities. In this paper, however, I take only one small step toward answering these questions. Let me now present the sources of the estimates that follow, making explicit the understanding, uh, underlying assumptions and commenting on the data so that the reader may have a basis for determining the limits, limitations of these estimates. The more important economic implications that emerge from this study will be left until later. So goes the body text. One, earnings that students forego. And then table one, table two. And then going all the way down to cost of the services provided by school and then conclude uh, the total cost of education 
and then concluding observations. So let's go. When costs of all levels of education are aggregated, the proportion of total costs attributable to earnings foregone has clearly risen over time. This is due to the much greater importance of secondary and higher education in more recent years, a change that outweighs the decline in the foregone earnings proportion of earnings proportion of high school education alone. For all levels of education together, earnings foregone were 26% of total cost in 1900 and 43% in 1956. Probably, the agricultural, uh, the, the actual 1900 figure should be somewhat higher than this because of foreign, foregone earnings of children in the higher education of elementary school ignored here, but such an adjustment would not substantially alter the picture. Between 1900 and 1956, the total resources committed to education in the United States rose about three and a half times. One, relative to consumer income in dollars, and two, relative to the gross formation of physical capital in, <clears throat> in dollars. Accordingly, if we look upon all the three resources going into education as consumption based on consumer be behavior, our estimates would not be inconsistent with the hypothesis that the demand for education has had a high income elast elasticity. If, however, we treat the resources entering into education as investments based on the behavior of be people seeking investment opportunities, our estimates then are not inconsistent with the hypothesis that the rates of return to education were relatively attractive. That is, they were enough larger than the rate of return to investments in physical capital to have included the implied larger rate of growth of this form of human capital. Again, it should be stressed that the underlying private and public motives that induced the people of the United States to increase so much the share of their resources going into education may have been cultural in ways that can hardly be thought of as consumption, or they may have been policy determined for purposes that seem remote from investment. Even if this were true, it would not preclude the possibility that the rates of return on the resources allocated to education were large simply as a favorable byproduct of whatever purposes motivated the large increases in resources entering into education. If so, the task becomes merely one of ascertaining their, these rates of return. If, however, consumer and investment behavior did <clears throat> play a substantial role in these private and public decisions. Then to this extent, economic theory will also be useful in explaining these two sets of behavior. Not only have the streams of resources entering into elementary, high school, and higher education increases, increased markedly, but they have changed relative to one another. Number one, though elementary education by this measure has increased at a slower rate than has either of the other two, it has come close to doubling its position relative to gross physical capital formation. It rose from about 5 to 9 percent of a latter between 1900 and 1956. The total cost of elementary education have been strongly affected by changes in, in enrollment and attendance. Increases in the average number of days that enrolled students have attended school played almost as large a part as did the increase in enrollment. The first of these rows, 60, 
and the second, 67, uh, 70, 73% between 1900 and 1956. However, it should be noted that this factor of attendance has nearly spent, uh, this factor of attendance has, has nearly spent itself. Average daily attendance is now within about 10% of its apparent maximum. Enrollment, on the other hand, will turn upward in response to the growth in population. Meanwhile, the salaries of elementary school teachers have been have been de <clears throat> declining relative to wages generally. Altogether, however, this seems plausible that investment in elementary education will not continue to rise at the rate that it did during the period covered by our estimates. As previously noted, some earnings were undoubtedly foregone by elementary pupils, especially by children at attending the upper grades. We have come upon bits of data that suggest that these earnings may have been ap appreciable during the early part of this period. Farm families, particularly at that time, still placed a considerable value on the work that their children could do for them. Moreover, fully a third of the population had farm residences in 1900 and 1910. Surely, a poor country endeavoring to establish a comprehensive program of elementary education must reckon the cost entailed in the earnings that older children will have to forego. Number two, the annual national cost of high school, high school education has risen markedly, so much so that in 1956, it was equal in amount to nearly 13% of gross physical capital formation compared to somewhat less than 2% in 1900. Enrollment in high school advanced from 0 0.7 to 7.7 .7 million between 1900 and 1956. It had already reached 7.1 million in 1940. The effect of the upsurge in population that began in the early 40s had started to make itself felt by 1956 the proportion of young people embarking upon a high school education being very large. Indeed, it was approaching its maximum. The increases in this ratio were striking. For example, in 1900, only about 11% of the 14 to 17 age group was enrolled in secondary schools. By 1956, the percent was about 75 let me emphasize once more the fact that earnings foregone has made up well over half the total cost of high school education in 1956. They were three-fifths three of total cost, which is somewhat less than at the beginning of this period. From this experience, one may infer that poor countries, even when they are no less poor than were the people of the United States in 1900, we'll find that most of the real cost of secondary education are a consequence of the earnings that students forego while attending school. Number three, the trend of total cost of higher education has been similar to that of higher high school costs. It rose at a slightly smaller rate than did total high school cost in the early part of the period and at a larger rate later. Relative to gross physical capital formation, it was about 2% in 1900 and slightly less than 12% in 1956. Enrollment in higher education increased from 328,000 in 1902 to 2.99 million in 1956. On of the edu uh, of the 18 to 21 age group, 4 percent 
were in residence and enrolled as undergraduates in higher education in 1900. By 1956, 32% of this age group were thus enrolled. The numbers in the college are group, uh, college age group will increase substantially soon as the children born with the upsurge in birth rates of the early 40s reached these ages. The proportion of this age group that will begin higher education is not readily discernible. The upper limit is not near at hand. As it is for elementary and high school education, there are many indications that it will continue to increase for some time to come. Earnings foregone by students attending college and universities were also about three-fifths of total cost in 1956. Here, however, we appear to observe an upward trend between 1900 and 1956. Number four, altogether, total costs of education have increased much more rapidly than have the total cost of the resources entering into physical capital. Between 1900 and 1956, the total cost of the three levels of education covered by this study have risen from 9 to 34 percent of the total entering into the formation of physical capital. Several more steps must be taken, however, before we can gauge the increases in the stock of capital development by education and its contribution to economic growth. These steps will entail allocating the cost of education between consumption and investment, determining the size of the stock of human capital formed by education, and ascertaining the rate of return to, the edu uh, to this education. I plan to examine this issue in subsequent papers. Thanks for listening.